So we are live. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I see some people are in chat saying hello already. Um, hopefully, a couple more people join us. Do you see how many people are on, John? Uh, I, yes, we have nine viewers. Hey, hey, everybody. Hello. So I guess everyone can hear us this time, which is good. <laughs> yes, hey, that's, hopefully. That's the right direction. <laughs> we just need the power not to go out. Oh, we have 27 oh, viewers now. Wow, it just shot up. There we go. All right. Um, so yeah, let's just get rolling then. Welcome. Um, I'm Ryan Dunleavy. I uh, create maps for role-playing games, including Blades in the Dark, mostly for Blades in the Dark. Um, and I wanted to have some chats with some of the creators and stuff. And obviously, um, you know, first name top of the list, John Harper, writer, designer, awesome guy. Um, so hi, John. How's it going? Hello, it's going well, uh, as well as can be expected. Uh, everything's weird, but um, yeah, can't complain. Um, we just uh, actually released a bunch of Blades supplementary material that had previously been sort of Kickstarter only uh, onto the website. So if anyone hasn't doesn't know about that, go to bladesinthedark.com and there's a whole bunch of new stuff there. And you'll also find a link to Ryan's map page where you can go get that cool stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's exciting. It's, it's, 52 it's maps now. 52. I think so. Whew. Jeez. I didn't realize it was that many. Nice. Yeah. yeah, no, it's been awesome. It's been much bigger and better than I could have ever thought it would be. And it's a lot of fun to do. So that's, that's a good thing. But you know, before we jump into all that, I wanted to um, kind of quickly talk about uh, where we've come from, John and um, so like, you know, 14 years ago, I moved to Seattle and started working with John and, uh, he introduced me to blades in the, uh, well, actually you introduced me to role playing in general. I had never role played before and D and D 4 E had just come out. And so you're like, you want to play a role playing game or, you know, you want to go play D and I was like, oh yeah, sure. I've never played it before. All right. Yeah. Why not? Um, which was awesome. We had a lot of fun with that. And then around that same time or a little, maybe like a year and a half after that, uh, Apocalypse World came out. And you're like, well, we're gonna play something else. So I was like, all right, cool, what's this? And that was the game that kind of like really blew me away. And I like D&D, it's fine, but like tabletop role-playing games, I think ex like help to expand the universe and the world a little bit more. Um, and, and it's sort of easier to play. It's less of like a fighting engine than I think D and D is, which which is awesome. Like we had some amazing Apocalypse World games. Yeah. Well, um, you also started in the fourth edition uh, D and D era, especially. We were playing that a lot, which is very much a kind of like bat battle game in, in a way. Right. That's like the superhero uh, battle yeah. game, right? Yeah. Right. We played our, our crazy <laughs> level twenty. I didn't know there was like you know other kind of you know. He, he, here's you know Pathfinder or, or you know 2.5 or whatever. I just didn't know that existed at all. So it was a, it was like, but Apocalypse World. And it's funny because I was at um, the uh, what is it, the uh, the Penny Arcade uh, board game um, event in Philadelphia. Yeah, um, I forget what it's called. Un but unplugged. Unplugged. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, I saw. I went to go get another copy of Apocalypse World because I, I I had lost mine. And uh, Vincent wasn't there, but his wife was, and I was talking to her, and she was talking to somebody, you know, trying to sell him the game. And I'm like, oh man, this game like totally changed the way that I looked at gaming, and like led me down this whole path of becoming like this huge nerdy gamer playing multiple times a night. I was like, it's worth it just for like the ten rules, you know, the ten principles, like very much worth to, to get it and read that just to like learn how to do it. Um, and she's like, oh, thanks for helping me sell books. <laughs> I, like, I people should buy Boggles Road. It's a great book. Um, 
But I wanted to tell uh, this one specific part, and it was an Apocalypse World-based game that you ran for me. Uh, and hopefully this will like segue us into Blades in the Dark. But if you remember, it was me and Brendan and Twyla, and it was the um, the, the space-based game, right? But it was it was Apocalypse World, but we were like on a in, um, like an outpost on like a planet or something. There's two outposts actually. And um, if you, yeah, I'm sure you remember this. Yep. Uh, Brendan was like this weird android dude, and I was like this kind of bumpkin with the golden heart truck driver guy, and and Twilight was kind of like my sidekick in there. And so you know, we like get we get like roped into this intrigue in between these two bases that are there. We like find a bomb, and like we take it back to this other base, and like, all these things happen. And the one thing about that game that really, it's not only stuck with me, that gave me like two, two big insights, one into gaming and two into you, um, which was when we finally, we came to like the, ba- the bad guy. <laughs> if you remember that, right? Oh, yeah. And we come to this guy and, and we try to do all these things like stop this bombing from happening. And we, we meet him finally and he's like, you you idiots you we i had a perfect plan to like fix all these things and this is the, and it would have fixed this and it would have fixed that and this would have been better and this and then you guys came in and screwed it all up like what the fuck are you doing idiots <laughs> excuse my language and then all three of us were kind of just like oh well there was i didn't know that other people had plans like what are you and you're just like why are you even here like get out of here we're like how can we help you're like i don't want your help <laughs> <laughs> and from that i was like one for, from us from like a gaming perspective i was like man you really should have a bad guy that has like a good idea of what he's trying to do and like rationale for it and the other thing and kind of like the bigger insight into you is that like you were playing and running this whole other world and game in your head while we were playing this little piece of it and then we came to this one part where where you were in your story <laughs> you're, like, you're like no i was doing this whole other thing i don't know what you guys are doing this whole time but i was running this thing <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's uh vincent and meg did a really good job in the apocalypse world text of taking those ideas and making them very actionable with those simple instructions you know tr- make try to make everyone human give everyone concrete desires and goals and for your npcs um and also look through, look at them through crosshairs, so you're they're not too precious to you. You know, you're like, I, yeah, when I'm playing that guy, his plans are the only ones that matter and the ones that are going to be good for everyone. But <laughs> as the GM, I'm supposed to look at him and be like, sucks to be you, man. The PCs are going to come and wreck all your shit, <laughs> which you did. We were like totally out. That guy was like, I don't care about you at all. It was It was just such a great moment of like, we stepped into this plot that we had like no... Yeah. reason to be in you hadn't done anything to like on. figure out what was going on you just sort right. of came in and did this thing it sort right. of lined yeah right and yeah. it was like run it was like in this plot that you already had running in the side it was like you were watching some movie and there was another movie that came at it from the <laughs> side and joined in and, and the guy was like where did this other movie come from <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but that that idea that like there's this whole other thing happening like off screen in your brain while you're running games with people along like that is in my memory how we like ran into blades in the dark which started as world of dungeons right which was like a couple people at the office playing that and then sort of steamrolled into i guess it was world of dungeons for quite a long time then it steamrolled into i'm just gonna run this game for you that i'm building over yeah it it started originally as like uh like 1980 ish classic basic Dungeons and Dragons with the old, the old purple box uh, and stuff. Right. And then that mutated into some house rules and Dungeon World was just almost done right around that time. Yeah. So I brought in some Dungeon World things about like last breath when you hit zero hit points, you like roll to, to not, maybe not die and that kind of thing. And then that, then I made Mortal Dungeons like the next week or something and into the odd came out and we started using into the odd stuff and the players no no one cared it was as far as they knew it was just D D, you know so i was right, right. kind of free to like do whatever um but yeah that game is the one that that culminated in the the now infamous uh end of the world moment <laughs> where 
the gates of death were destroyed and everything. And um, that's but I also remember didn't Jonathan? I think it was Jonathan Walton and I mm -hmm. played like another. You had like a side game. quest that we did where you went to the city we of like, magicians what? and like broke into the wizard's uh, sanctum and. And, and we that. stole that hand that the, the other or like we were two idiot again we were like these bumbling <laughs> fools that were like yeah go get that thing i guess that we grabbed this like artifact which like enabled this is another another facet of it, it was like i think it was just a one-off i don't I remember we played two games i think it was two maybe yeah just two mm -hmm. and it's like in your again in your head you were like oh you're gonna get this thing that's gonna affect this other game that i'm gonna bring in that's gonna like it was a part of like the apocalypse was like this thing that we got that like at the time we had no idea we were just like playing this side quest and where it works <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, let's well, go get this thing and you you played in the apocalypse world the really wild apocalypse world games where i was running two different t tables yeah 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 two different groups of players and one group stuff was like impacting they were like hearing rumors from the north and like stuff was coming down from there and vice versa and influencing each other and then we had that meeting at the bar that night where we all like talked about everything that had been happening and you're like that was you guys oh my god i can't believe you did that uh and then like people jumped ship and changed groups uh i think you switched over to the other uh, yeah the other i jumped one to and... one because my character like angled into their sort of their religious group yeah yeah right right but i guess the question is when when that was going on like did you did you envision that like as being part of that series like when we did that one shot with jonathan and i where you're like oh this is this can tie into this like was that where, where there's like subplots like running in your head as you're like pulling those two groups together i mean how much of like the groundwork of the world were you thinking of or like building in those times i mean clearly like blades is a giant book with like a lot i think i mean a reason a lot of people like it and it's, an, it's really interesting and kind of amazing uh tabletop role-playing games because of the depth of the world there like how much is there how like how much were you building of that as we were playing those games um i try to do as little kind of prep work as possible um so i try to like make some nodes uh, and draw lines between them to show relationships and stuff but that's about as far as it goes and and maybe give them like a very concrete like goal that this person this npc wants um and then the pcs come into it and as soon as they do something connected to one of those people it's either going to hurt that person or help that person or maybe it's neutral and then the people they're connected to if you hurt someone then the person that hates them too will like you better right so you start you start that process as soon as you do one thing it like starts to affect the other parts of the of the web um, yeah. and so it's yeah. easier for me as a gm to do i think it, this phrase was coined a long time ago on old um gaming forums but conservation of npcs is the idea that like whenever you can you can and you if you need to introduce a character for something reach over to someone who's already exists whether the players have met them or not um and use them and so always try to like use what you've got on that that faction map or whatever um instead of always right. making up something new and just bloating everything out to this big unmanageable thing right so we had this world and there was like a world map we were using and one of them was like the pillars of night were one part of that map and you decided like oh my character's from that i'm from the pillars of night and we we're like okay well, well, cool <laughs> i guess you're one of those well, those guys uh, <laughs> And then there was this like weird towery thing in, in another part, but it was on the same map as the uh, as like the main office D and D games. We were using the same right. map, so when you, you two were like, "Let's just do a one shot thing and do like a, a heist or something," I was I just was like, "Well, I, I'll use this map I, instead of like making up a whole new thing and yada yada yada." I can just look at this and go, "Oh, this is like where the wizards live. What's what's a wizard's school tower like? Okay, it'll be like this." Right, um, and then that gives me fodder for next time when we're playing with the bigger group i know that this important magical artifact has gone missing the wizards are going to send out their like inquisitors to look for it blah 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 so it like gives me all this stuff to work with i hadn't right. planned any of it ahead of time it's just like kind of there 
when you need it. Um, well, I mean, because that even right at the end of that session when we stole it and we gave it to the like the orc general guy or whatever, or um, they weren't orcs. They were, um, what were they? Yeah, they were like the stand-in. They they were this yeah. this kind of like destructive force, this horde that was coming down and and smashing civilization right but i think they we were him demon him descendants like this, is, like this is the sign of the apocalypse that's supposed to happen the gates are going <laughs> to open which like happened yeah. like mm -hmm. that fed directly in that other game i mean because it was it the hand of kotar or, I, I don't know I, it probably was i don't quite remember but i, I yeah i think, it, I think was. it was like a desiccated hand or something like that that we stole that we thought was like this interesting artifact and yeah clearly it <laughs> <laughs> the eye of kotar was the was the whole impetus for the other one which was amazing and then mike uh fish man, uh drinking the 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 black liquid the infamous yeah sure i'll drink that scene um which i don't know people haven't heard that yet we we're playing with the colby boy and, and we found like this black brackish water in this cavern somewhere it was in, it was in a temple dedicated to an ancient god <laughs> oh. very, very importantly yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was in a, like a, a sacrificial basin under this weird like tentacled thing <laughs> this black like yeah this black viscous liquid you're like what do you do i drink it and you were just like really <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and it's, it's fun like, yeah. i mean that's one of the f most okay. fun Things I've said as a GM because Mike said yes and uh, I make roll a save, yeah. um, and he got right. like seven to nine kind of thing. So I got to say, okay, first of all, your skin falls off, <laughs> um, like all of it, but you have scales underneath now, like fish scales. Um, and you know how you used to breathe air? That's over. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike's just looking I mean, at me. You, you can't breathe. I mean, you can't breathe right now. <laughs> I told you yeah. the fish scale thing that I just said. You have gills, but that all that all ties in. It's that those decisions you guys steal in that hand, Mike turning into a sea demon, and then ultimately helping to end the world and all of that. It 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 all did lead to us starting that first play tests for blades um, right. in that setting because again, like that setting, it turned into ghost lines with the like people who worked on the trains and stuff. Um, and then when we needed a game for like, let's do a fantasy city thing that's kind of like steampunky industrial era, I was like, oh, that sounds like that. It sounds like that. <laughs> let's just use that setting that we already right, have. Yeah, yeah. But we jumped ahead in time, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Do you remember our first sessions of of Blades? What that was? Well, I remember the first session. I remember <laughs> the very first <laughs> moment of the very first session. Uh, <laughs> I've told that story a lot. Maybe, maybe oh, you want to say what happened in the first second of the first Blades oh my God, game. Yeah. Well, it must have been a, like a little bit into it. Yeah. It was the first action, I guess. It was the first scene. scene. Yeah. It was the first scene yeah. because Dylan's character went up to make a sacrificial altar or like some kind of... I, I forget what he was actually trying to do. He was doing some kind of possession thing and making like runes and stuff on the floor. He was like across the street in his little like strange apartment uh, ritual space or whatever. Yeah, he was right, like, experimenting he was with a kind of weird ritual. Spirit magic, yeah. Right, right. And we go into the bar across the street and my the woman character who I think was like an old prostitute trying to be something better um, and like interrupt this conversation with these people. I, I don't know if they were they blue cart guards, maybe. Uh, there was a gang war that was about to start with the Unseen, and your contact was a member of the Unseen who, like, wanted you to help him overthrow his boss. Um, and the Unseen is, like, they're, like, a really powerful organization with some pretty heavy hitters, and he's like, yeah, that guy over there is, like, one of their best assassins. Um, and I know he's, I know he's been following me, so we need to kind of be careful. And you well, I, decided... Oh, I yeah. Well, no. You're just gonna go. I know. I'm, I'm like a, a, a street prostitute. I can. Uh, I can go over there and and, and talk some uh, nice into him. I think I'll be able to, you know, sweet talk him a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I just failed that role of sweet talking him, and he just turned around and stabbed me several times in the chest. 
<laughs> I just died? Yeah, he, he like, <laughs> I think what I said was something of like, there's there's like a, a thud in your chest and you feel the sharp pain and, and the lights go out and you're dead. Because cause he did it. And I was like. He did it so well that, like, nobody noticed in the bar. You know, he was just like, whoa, it's easy there. And, like, you know, helped you out or whatever. Or, like, I think he, like, propped you up in a booth or something. It was just, like, this clean, instant kill. <laughs> it's the first roll. First roll of the game. Very first roll. Yeah. I tried smooth talk him. I failed it. Oh, you're dead. You got stabbed in the heart. Oh, okay. <laughs> there were no resistance rolls back then. <laughs> there was nothing. That was it. Because we were, like, a lot of the things that we were talking about when you were developing it was, like, how deadly should it be? And I think, like, we had landed on, like, let's try it, like, real deadly. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> like that's okay. kind of where the idea of tears came from, that if you were really out of your league, you were risking... It was There, there weren't positions yet either, but it was, like this is desperate and it, the stakes are like life and death because this right. guy is so, so, so good. Right. Um, and there's nothing I could say basically that was going to dissuade this guy from not just immediately murdering me. Yeah. Because what, again, like it's like the stuff that you didn't know stuff, th wheels were in motion there and your contact was trying to essentially like use you as a scapegoat. Right. Um, right. But there, everyone else kind of already knew and like when you walked over to that person I know that he already knows that you're in on it and you're a threat <laughs> and, but you don't know that he knows right so, right yeah oh, um, I'm just because I was new to the game we're just like hey guys let's be a gang of uh, thieves or whatever yeah and so I'm thinking what? okay it's going to be very cat and mouse and they're going to like kind of you know observe people and start to get the lay of the land and figure out where their allegiances might work and stuff and you're just like no nah, i'm gonna go over and like be like directly confront this this assassin <laughs> well it wasn't like i was gonna like try and i wasn't like oh, i'm gonna go kill him I, no. I think i thought in my head like oh i'll just go sweet talk this guy yeah like that should be fine yeah and right and like you said like in his mind it's like well no this person obviously is a threat to me yeah he's like i'm gonna make an example of them and then all of this business about overthrowing the gang that'll be over <laughs> and i see this, this comment here interesting that the ghost came before the thiefiness because the very next thing that happened was like well hold on like there's ghosts right and then you're like yeah and i was like well i'd become a ghost and you're like i guess it's like okay well can i like possess a body and dylan's like <laughs> 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 I'm doing a spirit exactly. ritual across the street right now. <laughs> What's that? A ghost? I have this dead body here. <laughs> yeah, so you Which possessed you had a dead body. You possessed that body, and that's for Blades fans that are watching. Uh, Nerix is a is a character in the lists of NPCs that on the, in the playbooks. Nerix, the a possessor ghost, um, or sometimes they're they're called uh, like a sex worker of some kind. Um, and that's where that comes from. That Ryan's character was that was that person who was a was a possessor ghost, but was also um, had kind of like taken over this other person's life because they were wearing their body. And um, we we never really got to the bottom of what happened to the original person. That that plot thread kind of went away. But um, the original the the dead body. Yeah, the but the person that you. The, the body that you possessed and yeah. used like we don't know what I, I maybe dylan did something with the spirit there i forget there was a whole like spirit market thing where he was dealing with that demon who traded for them in on the grotto and stuff um, oh yeah yeah the underwater the half uh sunken uh bar i should mm -hmm. do that on the map actually that'd be cool. oh that'd be cool yeah the underwater bar mm -hmm. yeah yeah that was where the demon like a demon worked it wasn't satara it was another demon yeah the, the, hooded, the hooded guy yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Who was like one of the big impetuses to like start the end of the world as well? Yes, because he was in the original Dungeon World game or World of Dungeons game, and yeah. that was what was yeah. weird when, when we did that. Like we went into this new setting, and it was like a thousand years later, and you're like, you go to some grotto, and there's like a guy with a hood up. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> hmm, I guess he wasn't a regular human. <laughs> <laughs> It's his great, 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 great grandson, and they just always wore the same hood. <laughs> but again, there is that that conservation of of material kind of idea. Uh, right, like right. I can just take this thing that we already have and and use it. Um, 
Like why, why not just keep doing that? Yeah. Yeah, if it if it works. Um, and it's not... I mean, Satara lived forever and still around and is like a main... Every time I have a game with Blades in the Dark, I have Sitaras in it uh, as the Water Demon and uh, the Ayakotar somehow makes an appearance somewhere. Um, <laughs> and someone's always wants to pick it up and play with it. Um, which is, is funny. And I think it was it was Keith, right, that had it, and he could control Mike, sort of. Yeah, as long as it was, like, touching his skin, uh, he could... To command, no ill effect. Yeah, he, he, could, he could command demons, and so he came up with this whole deal of how he was gonna have it ready at the right time, and um, Mike... There was, a, like, there was, like, a, a race between them to get the reflexes ability, because it lets you go first... And right. <laughs> uh, Keith wanted to be able to touch, give a command before Mike could kill him or whatever. But Dylan ended up with it at one point in a, in the first Blades playtest, uh, and he was he like did. he like strapped it to himself under his clothes with with uh, gauze because or something. It was burning itself into his. Skin it was slowly it was like, like yeah. It, he, yeah, it was he, like he, like he realized murdered. at one point that he couldn't take it off anymore. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and he was like, wait, what? <laughs> I took the straps off. Oh, it doesn't go anywhere. Wait, what? Yeah. There, there were so many sessions where we tried to decide what the best words to use to like try and control because you can only do like one command at a time. And so there was many a session where it was like, all right, you need to say these exact words. There, there was a particular <laughs> phrase that was developed over time after a few bad mistakes <laughs> uh, trying to command Satara. And I think Dylan came up with it. And it was first doing us no harm. <laughs> then blah 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 blah. Right, right. You had, <laughs> you had to you had to make sure you said that first part. For some there were several sessions where Sitaro was just standing in the corner of our lair because he's like, stay there. And then we just like we're like wait for us to be able to use you. And then like every time we came in, it was this shark eyed demon just like staring murder at us, like and then and, like wanting to kill us. But we would just come and be like, Hey Sitaro, what's going on? Yeah, we're gonna go to there. Just hatred spilling out of just like waiting. It was like this weapon we had. It was so ridiculous. It was so dumb. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ah, right. You know what happens. Yeah. But that game, I think that game where the woman was possessed and stuff, that like fizzled out for a little bit, I think. We went and then through, I mean, that, I think if, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that that initial playtest group for Blades was a at least a year and a little more um, just iterating blades. And I think somewhere between version six and version 12 or whatever, the PCs changed. And I think we kind of, cause all of a sudden now there was like, Oh, we can like have a certain type of crew. So let's, let's create that and make some new characters that are in that crew. And I think yeah. some of those initial storylines kind of faded in and out. Um, well, I think one of one of the things that happened was we started to we started to ask ourselves like what are we doing, like what what is our purpose as a group, and that sort of became a larger question of like who we are in the world. And there were several games like Null Vector and a couple other uh, games that we played. With. And what was the Cyberpunk one? Um, uh, Null Vector, and then we played Razors uh, too, which Razors, was like right, the right. modern day kind of thing. Right, right. And that was like the same kind of thing. Like, what is our, what is our group? And that, that like, I think that started to become the building blocks of like some of the tier ideas and, and then like the turf war thing as well um, kind of grew out of that idea. Cause there, it often came back to when like, cause like me and Dylan and, and um, Zane, and I think it was Twyla also that played with us sometimes, like we would eventually reach, but we just didn't want to kill people all the time, right? Like we didn't want to do that. And so it was always like, what's the bigger purpose of our group? And I think we had those conversations often. And that's like, out of that grew this idea, I think of like, like I said, the turf battles and stuff. And so, and then I also think from that uh, came the, I'm going to say maybe positions or something about where like, Positions, that, they they were in, they were in the game really early on, yeah. um, but they were like, uh, they, they it, it was always a part of the game that there was this kind of idea of how much you were gonna do versus how much you were risking to yourself, 
Right. Remember right. those early versions that had those like two ladders, and you, right. you yeah, would like yeah, yeah. put stuff on the ladders, and it, it, that was weird. Um, but yeah, by the, by the time we were doing razors ish stuff, um, the positions got codified into like an actual role instead of all of that like business. Right. It was like you're controlled, so roll and read uh, under the controlled, you know, right. Um, so I think that's when they we realized that they were really clicking, and then also you you deciding to play like a media group, a group of people that wanted to be like media stars. Right, uh, right, right. We wanted to record everything in our on our boat that we were traveling around. With. Yeah, you had like GoPros, and one of your main contacts was like a HBO feature producer. <laughs> you were you were trying to woo to right. like get a deal with the network and stuff. Um, <laughs> And that helped develop the cruise a lot because it it really highlighted like well what kind of stuff should cruise give you it shouldn't just be like we're richer now or something like it needed to have these thematic qualities um and so the the crew special abilities started to appear um, right I, right exactly because it was less again like we didn't want to kill people all the time and it wasn't it didn't always have to be about money and so like that's that's kind of where we started like flushing that part out and the other the other thing i wanted to say was the which which came out of several of our games and most notably i think our long long uh starts without numbers game which was the like jump right to the action the engagement role yeah which is like one of the best things in blades and one of the things that like any game that i run now like has an engagement i'm like uh no engagement role. like let's just start playing the game like, it's just better we could talk forever about all this crap but like well, let's just play the game and make that engagement roll. And I think a lot of that, because it was the two or three session long uh, assassination game that really like that, that like how that played out. Jesus, God. Yeah. I mean, it was awesome, but <laughs> it, it was actually, I think we all, <laughs> we all enjoyed it. We, we had, I, it, I think it was three sessions that it was were three, it was two solid sessions of just planning basically in character, like on the ship, like having a meeting about how you're gonna assassinate this guy, uh, and then one 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 attempt that di did not go well at all, but wasn't yeah. catastrophic enough. You didn't get they weren't aware of you, um, and then back to the next set of planning, and it was a really interesting puzzle because of the way some of the psychic powers work in that game. Yeah, um, yeah. and we had fun, but the prospect of taking on assassination contracts and like doing that as our weekly role-playing night was we were all like no way we're not no, doing that yeah, that's that was, we did that one and we're like we don't have to do that again that's yeah true. yeah we, we killed that guy great we can stop doing that but it was like that and and i think even as we were trying to determine like what our crew was and and those ideas and then like how we were going to go about doing scores like that's i think that engagement role like came up more and more when we talked about it. it was like oh we should just like be able to jump right into the action and like figure out like are things bad or good or not and i remember like i ran um the regiment aliens and that was like one of the first times i really used that it was like all right engagement roll you're going into the base like how did it go like oh there's like i think it was middling and there was a storm and you couldn't go in the roof so you had to go in the other entrance and stuff but like it just made it so much better than like arguing, especially in a military game where it can come down to like all kinds of tactics and stuff. It's like, no, let's just like jump right into it. And so like that, that the way that that started to come about was, was and implemented like work really well. And was that, I mean, how late into the game do you think that was development? Well, the, like you said, the regiment had the engagement role. Uh, right at the beginning of its existence, pretty much. Um, yeah. and that was probably, I don't know, at least a year before the blades play test started. Um, mm. but the existence of it, like it was, there it was funny because the blades group was such, everyone was so dedicated to the play test. It was like iteration, iteration, iteration. Every week Dylan's like, so we get new character sheets, you know, and yeah, here you go. We got to fill them out again. <laughs> right. Um, and so because of that, uh, there were like practices that were happening mm -hmm. and they would go on for a while as a kind of informal process. 
until right. at some point along the way we were like, okay, let's make this official and call it whatever. Like the Devil's Bargain was a thing that you and I back and forth did all the time right. um, in every game we've played together. Uh, and in <laughs> at some point along the way, Dylan was like, that should be a mechanic. Um, so I think the engagement role was kind of like that. We sometimes were doing it without really calling it that in in the blade sessions yeah um mm -hmm. but then when you were running uh aliens and I, I was running the regiment before that like standard regiment stuff um yeah i think it definitely clicked somewhere in there like oh yeah this is perfect for scores <laughs> yeah we, we've well, kind of been doing it but now we need to make it like this official thing yeah it needs to like jump into the to the actual text of it and you uh, mentioning the devil's bargain actually i don't know when the because it was like Blades was like built on it was powered by the apocalypse for a while. It was two D six, right? Yeah. Like when I forget when that switchover happened to using multiple. I don't even know if I was there for that. It was on. fairly early on. Um, really, I thought it was much later. I thought we were always using two D six for a long time because we started developing like the the dot system. Like I remember talking a lot about that, like the columns and the rows of how many dots and what that stood for and how many. Yeah. There was a lot of back and forth about that for a while, but I didn't think it involved dice. I thought that was plus minuses for a while. It was. There was a 1d6 for a while. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, but oh. um, you it, you would do your position and effect and everything, but you always just rolled one die, um, and it was you know still 6, 4, 5, and 1 to 3. Um, so your, the, like chance of getting the six never changed right just your skill made your position way way better or way or way, way oh worse. okay Remember yeah that? Right, right. yeah um yeah it it bounced all around mechanically um until i think i think it was mostly because of um kind of like helping dice and and character growth kind of stuff where we realized it was kind of more fun to be like, oh, I have three dice now, and oh, you're helping me, so now I have four, and like, oh, that's cool. Um, right, everyone, right, right. Everyone liked having that physicality to the to the character. Yeah, like the, and the conversation it. around like how many dice it should be and stuff like that. I think um, it adds a lot to like what the game can be, especially as a crew, and like you should be helping each other and stuff like that. I think that's uh, and the stress system um, also like when was that implemented? That was again, man. Whew. <laughs> yeah a lot there <laughs> yeah it's it's a lot actually a andrew gillis and i did a video i think it's two hours long on my youtube channel um we went back through like all the old character sheets uh that oh, i could that wow. i could find um yeah and tried to like talk through the the discernible iterations of blades so if you're interested right. go to my youtube channel you can you can watch that um <laughs> but talking well, to you I'm now <laughs> talking to you now it it strikes me um, how like you were there for everything, like you well a lot you, of it you were sure. in every game that ult that leads up to Blades in the Dark. But from the original Dungeons and Dragons game at work, through start the regiment stars out number, our apocalypse world stuff, yeah, ghost lines. Initial I mean, blades, we play razors. Like two times a, we would play like two times a week, and you and I would like talk about it at lunch like every day. Mm -hmm. And when I wasn't in one of the sessions for Bogus World, you were talking to me about it at lunch. Like, <laughs> it's Let true. Me tell you what happened? I was like, okay, <laughs> let's go. What's going on in their world? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it, it was cool. It, it 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 was a luxury as a designer to have very engaged, interested people to play with and bounce ideas off of and talk about and have that like just constantly um because yeah. we worked together too so it was like just always there and um and dylan was like really engaged in that way too right because i mean he did scum and villainy right uh, that's out already right or? no dylan did dylan is doing um blades against darkness the kind of DNA oh right, right right one yeah um yeah he was totally engaged with it um it's it's been really cool it's it was a great experience and even after the kickstarter like kind of doing yet, a, yet another design phase um with the community involved there were like almost a hundred dedicated playtest groups that were giving feedback during that time and like it was just another awesome luxury to have all these people show up and care and like 
um, contributed. Was there anything you know? that, that came out of those play tests that, like, looking back on it now, you wish would have made it into the game? Um, hmm. They're like, maybe it's like, oh, well, that was really neat, and I like that, but then it got cut, and now I'm like, eh, maybe it would have been good. I guess, like, in retrospect, like, now that it's out and you've played it and seen people play it, like, how do you – how are your feelings about it? How did it – how it all kind of played out, I guess, to use a pun. Yeah. I'm I'm really happy with, uh, with how it's been received. I mean, it, people seem to really love it. Um, or at least it uh, – like – for me, I think a, a good success for something, any kind of creative work really is to connect with the people that really love it and also turn away the people that are going to hate it, you know, <laughs> like don't try to just be everything to everyone. And, and I think Blades does a pretty good job of signaling that there are some still some people that come to it. And it, if they've only played Lasers and Feelings or something, one of my simple little games, you know, they're like, what the hell is this? This game is so complicated. Um, <laughs> but uh, I see somebody wrote on here Mayhem. Yeah, yeah, murder, yeah. murder, and mayhem were um, were a actions in the game because um, there it sounds great. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that should be its own game, though. Yeah, murder, May mayhem became wreck, and and murder was cut entirely. Um, right, right, but it was cool. Yeah, I I do miss those. They, they were fun when they existed. Um, but that's it's that's good. an important change. Like that was a realization process through all these games with Ryan and that group. Uh, realizing that you really needed um to hone that action list there were 16 actions at one point um yeah. and then after the kickstarter even realizing oh i need to hone them in this second way where they really are actions not outcomes or goals or whatever right um, right right they're the thing you're actually doing uh and you know it made murder it it was hard. It was hard to be like, well, I'm murdering him. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, I use my murder skill. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I remember specifically mayhem is interesting because there's that like Dylan was really hard on like putting mayhem in there. And I think even Zane was and, and, and going back and forth about mayhem and wreck and the differences. And like, it was a lot of like parsing those ideas of what they are. Yeah. Right. And so, because they are, I mean, like, sure, like, we wreck something and, and cause mayhem, like, sort of similar, but they're clearly very different things. Um, yeah. So that, that was, like, some of the more interesting, like, let's talk about what these words mean moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what do we actually mean by these words in here? Um, which is, it, 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 that's that's where, like, a lot of that nuance came in. Of, like, and, and, and pairing that list down, like you said, like, how do you, like, constrict all this stuff into certain things um t turning it into three lists with their own kind of like overarching idea of what they are i think really helped when when you hit on that like realization like oh like you have this thing that holds these and they also go this way yeah this kind of more like three-dimensional idea of how your skills work well do you remember um, there was an early version where those buckets of things were Cutter, Lurk, Leech, Whisper. Right. You, everyone right. had those on their sheet. Yeah, and you were like, yeah. oh, I'm a little bit Lurk, I'm a little bit Cutter, you know, and you would kind of like <laughs> multi-class, uh, which is still true in the game because of the way advancement works. Like, you can just take abilities from any of the playbooks. So right, right. everyone is everything, uh, kind of. But Because um, I resisted having playbooks for so long. There was just, everyone had the same character sheet. Uh and it was pretty late in our private playtesting um, where I was like, yeah, these need to be Apocalypse World style because you want to have something you can wrap your brain around and be like, I am this. Um, right, right, right. Instead of like, well, pick from these 24 options, you know. Right, right. And I think that's where like the idea of what the crew was sort of like, like it's squeezed in this little bit where it's like, well, you can have a crew and a bunch of you can do a bunch of different things also. And then it was like, okay, too much constriction. And then like had to open it back up a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it was good to go through that to understand like, well, that doesn't work. Like everybody can't be everything all the time. And I think we had a lot of conversations about how, how people play games in that, like, well, I want to be good at everything. And like this min maxing sort of idea 
Um, and like, not how to mitigate that, but like, I guess not making it as important to like be the best at all the things or, or like really awesome at one thing. I think it, it, every time I play Blaze in the Dark, I never like go super heavy in like a, like one skill or anything like that. I'm always kind of like, well, I want to be able to do a little bit of everything. Um, but I guess you can do it that way. But I think we talked a lot about that and, um, and dying. And that was, and that's kind of like relating back to that story about, uh, about my first character getting murdered right away because you knew that I was okay with that, but that's yeah. not always the case with people. Right. And like, I, I don't know. How do you think that affected your idea of Blades in the Dark? Because, you know, we had always talked at like, you know, it was actually kind of a multi-level conversation where like people don't like their characters to die. But even worse than that, people don't like to take their you, you to take their shit away. That's like the worst thing that could possibly happen. Like you can murder them, but just make sure all my stuff stays with my dead body. <laughs> if you take their stuff, like people freak out. That's like huge problem for a lot of people. How, like those conversations that we, how do you think that like worked out in the game or played out in, in terms of like stuff and dying in, in the game? I think, uh, for, for death and stuff, um, once, once resistance roles got really codified, uh, and you know, they always succeed. Um, but there's this, this stress, you know, risk gamble that you take. Um, and they're always player initiated. The GM can't ever say make a stress roll or make a resistance roll or take two stress or anything like that. Right. Um, players always decide when they take stress and always decide when they resist. So hmm. it's kind of a stylistic choice. Like you and I as as players are some, somewhat similar, I think. And, you know, we might be like, yeah, that guy totally takes me by surprise and stabs me in the heart and I die. You know, <laughs> and, and the other player's like, dude, you can re make a resistance roll. You don't have to die. Like, nah. It got me. <laughs> yeah, but it's cool that I died. <laughs> yeah, and especially in 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 Duskwall Blades, because like I could, I'll be a ghost now. That'll be fun. Right, right. Um, or you can be like, no, no, no. I'm I'll I'll resist it. I'm obviously totally screwed up here, uh, but that's okay. I, I'll I'll resist it, and we'll follow the fiction from there, depending on how that goes. But um, I I I tried to give, and and there's a bunch of text in Blades about this, but. I tried to give people this set of tools to play with so that they could kind of um, create their their own sort of style guide for their Blades in the Dark uh, TV show or whatever. Um, right. We want it to be super gritty and high lethality and, you know, we are in danger of getting sick and, and cold because we live in squalor and that are like, okay, cool, you can do all that. You can, you like, constantly threaten harm because of whatever bad food or or uh, exposure or whatever um or you can be like yeah my two dots in skirmish means when i say i draw my rapier and i hold off uh this this squad of blue coats so my friends can escape you go oh that's only risky yeah go ahead uh if you want to <laughs> you know you can like change or spin the dials of all of the different those different bits. Right, right, right. But it yeah. requires... Like pretty realism and, and adventure of, of what, how you want to visit. Is it, is it the serial pulp or the gritty realism game? Yeah. But it really the game really asks a lot of the pl people playing it to have an opinion about that and then step right. up and do it. Because it's not like, oh, you have 6 HP and this weapon does D8 damage, so, pff, you know, fuck you. Um, <laughs> which is a totally good way to design a role-playing game. Uh, but I, I did want Blades to be that kind of, like, um, creative outlet. Like, I, we, we have a certain point of view that we want to have as a group. And, right. And we, we can use these tools to express it. I guess the GM doesn't kill you. You kill yourself. <laughs> I mean, kind of, yeah. There are, there are some choose, edge cases. You whether you die, right? Like, that's kind of the, the, the whole thing, right? And, yeah. And even position being like well that's really risky it's like well i won't do that then like mm -hmm. which is you know it's a good way to kind of allow someone to sit back and be like yeah how do we do a better job of this um yeah and that could, i don't know why this brings it to mind but the whole um i guess like murder hobos versus sort of the idea of um blades because 
you know, when people die, like trouble is brought down on you by the death seeker crows. Was that like intentional to make people kind of think more about like not just murdering their way through all, like all of everything? Yeah. A lot of other games are just usually like, oh, well, I guess we're just going to kill everybody now. Yeah, it definitely was a fact. I mean, it was kind of a consequence of the world that was created because of the cataclysm. Mm. Um, ghosts are going to be a problem just sort of in the lore. Uh, but once I decided like, yeah, okay. So the cities are protected by these lightning barriers. The Deathlands outside are just not, can't really survive there. Well, what do you do? You can't have your protected city safe zone get overrun by ghosts. So there must be a thing people do to, stop that from happening right right um and then also it just had this knock-on effect of like a game about uh these these um underworld types but you can't ever skip town and wait for the heat to die down or anything you're just like you're just there <laughs> so <laughs> everything you do is has all the consequences are just gonna happen right um, right so yeah that i think that helped a lot too uh to just create that little engine of heat and entanglements and and uh, the the extra stuff from from killing and from uh, punching way up, like the, if it's a, a high uh, higher tier or well connected victim, then you get more heat and more attention, and the blue coats have to care because a rich person is expecting them to do their jobs and not, you know all that. Right. Um, Have you seen or, or been in any games where like the emperor himself got involved in any of the action? Uh, not directly in any of the games I've done, but um, nobody's, well, nobody's punched that high. That's not quite right. <laughs> well, yeah, um, Judd's uh, Blue Coats series that he ran recently, um, semi recently. It's been ongoing for a while, but um, because of the way the the Blue Coats supplement works um your characters might be an inspector that's been sent to duskwall on a mandate from theoretically from the high office of justice of the, of right, the right. emperor's court you know so you're kind of on a mandate from the emperor sort of working for the emperor um and judd has definitely like in injected a few like bits of uh his own lore and like talking about imperial city and like the how the emperor might be um, and then Sean Nittner just released um, it uh, for free. It's on his website. There's a link on the Blades website in the supplements section. Uh, it's called Broken Spire, and it's a supplement where you create a crew um, and characters uh, just for the, just for Broken Spire. It has its own little creation system. Um, you pick from three different options of people who have spent years, decades, generations. Uh, and you and you start at different tiers. You can start at tier five, I think, is the top. Um, uh, have spent all this time and effort to position themselves to kill the immortal emperor. They're going to assassinate him. Ah, oh, cool. So you can nice. play his quicksilver guard, his like personal bodyguard that's ready to like turn on him. Um, <laughs> you can play uh, like other powerful factors. I don't want to spoil it. There's some good stuff in there, but um, <laughs> uh, one of them has to do with certain characters from certain world of dungeons games from from the past <laughs> right um, right <laughs> so yeah some of those people's ghosts you know they're still around so um <laughs> they, they have they have an agenda uh but sean's added all these different like kind of lore questions and stuff like people say the emperor is like this you know what and so you get to kind of create your own version uh and what his strengths and weaknesses might be and and that kind of stuff so the murmurs of his actual name yeah, exactly no one knows <laughs> <laughs> his secret name uh oh people know <laughs> some uh, people know uh, <laughs> yeah is, um, so that's if, we, if you were running a game for us our, our immediate goal would have been to become gods and uh, <laughs> defeat the emperor you know that right? <laughs> yeah I don't know what half of our games we became gods at the end of it. So. <laughs> it's, that was usually our goal. Was like, how how we live forever? And whenever whenever there was a sandbox, it, I would always do like, oh, here's like ordinary jobs uh, or like kind of mid tier jobs where you're gonna face some opposition and it's gonna be a little squirrely. And then there's like the really weird one about the 
the ship that went missing in the dark quadrant and no one's ever heard of it for thousands of and everyone's like that one we're doing that one <laughs> fast forward six sessions and everyone's going how do we get into so much trouble ah. <laughs> why, why is everybody after us what are you talking about you went after the highest profile target you could possibly find twice that happened twice it did <laughs> Yeah, it, things got so bad in that Stars Without Number game that the PCs sold off all their most valuable stuff, erased their identities, spent all of that money on clean new identities to start fresh lives over because they could not deal with the repercussions of what they'd done. <laughs> the heat was too high. And then, having done that and cleared, cleaned the slate, they immediately went back and got into just as much trouble. Like, <laughs> immediately. It was arguably worse. <laughs> it, was, it was worse, yeah, it was. We're like, well, we finally cleaned up that mess. <laughs> What's that mess over there? <laughs> Run towards it! <laughs> yeah, it was... That I mean, what more could you scary. want as a GM? It was two years, that game. Two years, yeah. That was, was, a, that was incredible. It was so so much fun. Um, I actually the the kind of resistance roll uh, concept and some of the blades concepts. Um, I usually mention you when I'm talking about mechanical stuff because something you did in that Stars Without Number game de planted a seed for s kind of some of the ideas in Blades in the Dark. It's when did it have something to do with Terrence Bradshaw? Well, yeah. Uh, at, at, <laughs> Near the height of the initial um, trouble, uh, this this crew of ne'er do wells, Ryan's character, Terrence Bradshaw, was the pilot uh, of of the ship, and they, it, things got so bad that a, a faction was willing to kill them over it. A very powerful faction, and that faction happens to have like, te teleporting cyber psychic. Cyber they have teleporting yeah. psychic cyber ninjas as one of their assets and so i was like well what would i do if i was this faction and i wanted to kill these idiots who had fucked up some of my shit so i'll just have <laughs> teleporting assassins just appear on their ship with guns to their heads and just kill them <laughs> it was a good plan it was a good you didn't spend two sessions thinking about it but no you so, should have. so they did and <laughs> There was a reason for them not to immediately kill everybody because they didn't know an important fact. And so they teleport onto the ship and every character has two cyber ninja psychics with like literally like guns to their heads and they need some information. And of course, you know, they're just going to dispose of everybody once they find out what's going on. Um, but it turned out that Terrence Bradshaw was sitting in the pilot's chair <laughs> of the ship and it's in port, you know, at a space dock or whatever. And Ryan's like, can I can I just like turn on the hyperdrive like from a dead stop? Is that a thing you can do? Can you just like go to 11 all of a sudden on the ship? I do a spot. I wanted to, I wanted to spin the ship. Yeah. Is what I wanted to you do. Wanted to, like, I wanted to do literally the death spiral. You wanted like, to, to like, yeah, to immediately blast the engines at full power. That's right. It wasn't the hyperdrive. You were just going to like. I was just going to go full power and spin. Full G force, like, highest G as possible. Because you're like, I'm sitting in the, like, anti-G pilot chair, like, thing <laughs> oh that protects crap, me. Dude. And I'm like, no. Well, I was like, okay, so you're going to somehow do that while these two cyber ninjas go like that with their trigger fingers. So it's a race between this and however you fucking turn suddenly like dead cold start this thing <laughs> and so we decided uh oh D dylan's character was also there and he he had done some stuff that made this somewhat feasible to try um to change some stuff on the ship so i gave you some stupid roll like yeah like i don't know it was it was essentially like you know roll a perfect roll um and, and and you're like, and if you do this, you're probably going to kill everybody. Yeah. Well, we didn't even get to that right immediately because I, and this was the spirit of the blades thing that I, that I always tell people. I said, okay, you can make that roll and uh, yeah, whatever it was, it's like a 5% chance or something. Right. And, I, um, and you were like, okay, so, if, but if I fail, they just kill me. 
<laughs> like they just pull the triggers and they kill me if I fail this roll. I that that's the only bad. That's the only downside. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, I was like, oh, just as long as we have the consequences out there, yes, we need to know. Yes, that is the only downside. <laughs> and you're like, cool, okay, yeah, I I, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> and and you did you succeeded and launched the ship off and it pulped everyone inside including the other pcs um i didn't pulp them it killed everyone broke their necks and stuff and uh everyone had to make saving throws and the one and only character on the ship who had the psychic ability that could s save people from death succeeded at her save didn't <laughs> immediately die everyone else <laughs> did die and then you brought the ship under control and she crawled through the ship w despite her injuries and psychically resuscitated everybody <laughs> but uh that that moment that moment of yeah i'll do it like what's the worst thing that can happen um uh, my character dies okay uh <laughs> that that s spirit just was in all all the games we played together and um i got very used to it and um i wanted but i wanted to create by... something that would give other people the chance to to have that feeling <laughs> right but you started by saying that it did that influence the resistance idea i guess yeah people could roll. yeah because uh i like like we said before not everyone is quite as um excited to create a new character when <laughs> when their other one dies <laughs> Uh, I'm not create. I'm, I'm not excited to create a new character. I'm excited just to die. Yeah, well, that's true. In, um, an ex in a good way, in an exciting way. In an exciting way, right, right. But when you know you have that resistance role, like safety net, um, right, right, you can be like, yeah, okay, I, I'll, I will do the super reckless thing. Um, Got yeah, right, right, right. And because um, you can always mitigate it in a way, and it's not like it's, it's good. It's not like, free. Yeah. Right, right, right. There are consequences, which is great. Again, like a good system there of like. Yeah, try the crazy thing. Oh, well, now you're like super stressed out about it or whatever. You might, and maybe you even did it. So it's good to have consequences like that. Um, it's, I think it's one of the, the shortcomings of, of something like D&D &D where there's like, it's usually a binary on or off and like maybe you lose hit points or whatever. But um, it, I think it, it can work out a lot better when you have those sort of, uh, those choices, I guess, to make. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else have we got? I had some questions. I don't know. Did I ask any of them? Um, how's Agon going to switch gears? Uh, great. It's it's done. So, it's out. So you, well, you wrote Agon a long time ago. You, that was your first or second game that you published. Maybe your first. Technically, the the first one I published as like an indie developer i had i had made make games before but um, right yeah that was like your first one that was 2006 how, yeah right and so with your experience with blades and how that played out in the game itself how did that influence agon did you change a lot of the core rules did you yeah i don't play agon i don't and i i backed the kickstarter but i i don't think i've ever and i downloaded it i don't think i've ever played it i don't think, I don't I've ever think you it. played first edition i mean not with me anyway uh, no, I don't think so. that was before you came to Seattle. Um, yeah, it's very, very, very different. Uh, we we rewrote the whole thing, Sean Nittner and I, um, and it's at first edition. Agon was, uh, and they're both about Greek heroes um, going on sort of one shot island adventures with that are plagued by monsters or strife from the gods or whatever. And you go to an island and you deal with that trouble and save the people and stuff. And then you sail off to the next thing. Very serialized kind of thing. Um, right. But the first one was kind of a competitive platform. It was designed as this, like, what if you could, what if you could write a role-playing game so that everyone was competing on even ground, including the GM. And so everyone had like these, these restricted budgets and things the GM could like, threaten a certain amount of trouble but it came from this pool of stuff that they could spend and we tried to like even everyone out so you could really not pull your punches as the gm and be like yeah i just i have x amount of authority here and the players have that much and there was like a scoring system with glory and stuff and um it was it was fun and and uh people liked it 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 was a little too complicated a little clunky in in some ways 
uh, and over the years, you know, I kind of just stopped promoting it. And um, there were still, still some tournaments going on, even as recently as last year. At, at some conventions, people would do Agon tournaments and, and like, have multiple rounds and stuff. Um, which is cool. Like, uh, that game still exists. You can still get it, the old version. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I think it's, I think it's on Lulu uh, still. But um, with this version, we wanted to really lean into the over-the-top fantasy ancient world thing, leaping off a mountain and and cutting the heads off the Hydra, and like just being like really this this really bold kind of thing um and still the heroes competing for glory to see who's most glorious and who's best and all that but kind of yet yeah, 12 years later um the idea of like budgets and spending points and stuff you're like ah, eh, there's there's ways to do this that isn't that um, right and we don't need to have this like strict com competition thing going anymore. We can instead have these kind of like um, somewhat blades influence kind of mechanics around um, achievement and and risk and some of the gambling kind of feel to things. Um, Do they still fight each other? No. Well, there's still like a, a com competition for for most glorious hero. Um, yeah. In every single contest. Uh, all the heroes are, are ranked essentially based on how you did um, and from those who suffer who, who are defeated by the enemy to those that kind of prevail against the enemy to the single hero who's the best uh, and um, that that hero earns the lion's share of the glory and everyone else gets a trickle down a lesser amount of glory uh, and glory is kind of the main thing that drives your character advancement and uh, well there's two tracks there's your glory and then your fate, uh, which is sort of like trauma in blades. It's like your permanent harm that never goes right. away. Yeah. Um, and when you reach your fate, your hero's story comes to an end and you tell your epilogue based on how much glory you earned and stuff. Um, but as your fate advances, you also become more powerful because you're like, you know, a more seasoned right, uh, yeah. hero. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, very much focused on action and resolving things very quickly. Um, the old Agon had some long knockdown drag out fights that would take like a D&D &D battle, like it would take, you know, an hour or more. Um, and the new one is one, one roll contest for everything. You just like yeah. have it all out, boom, um, and resolve it. Uh, so it's very fast paced and, um, it's, it's suitable to like that zero prep. Like, hey, let's do an Agon Island tonight. It takes like two hours maybe to do an island. Uh, and you can just knock it out, and we give you twelve pre-made islands in the book, so you can just pick it up and and go. Um, and that reminds me of something else that we talked a lot about, and I don't know if I've encountered it much in the game, but um, like player versus player action in games. And have you seen that play out a lot in Blades? Mm -hmm. How's that worked? Because I know, like we would, like with Apocalypse World, some people had issues with that. I don't think, in some, like I don't think we ever did, or people we played with, it was just like I don't know, roll against each other, I guess, and see what happens. And then, like, we were always cool. very PvP oriented in our in our local game groups. Um, yeah, uh, with you and with uh, Paul and Shannon and Sage and that group too. Um, yeah, most of the games were driven by some kind of interplayer dynamic, whether it was a direct antagonism sometimes or just rivals or whatever um we we made that video with peter years ago uh where we played apocalypse world and essentially just had a four-player pvp match for the whole session <laughs> um, I forgot this baker was there we're like we're just gonna play with her you don't mind <laughs> but it was really good because at at that time back then people were struggling to understand how to do PvP and stuff like Apocalypse World, um, where there's no like opposed roles and stuff. So we uh, kind of did a demo of how to do it, and right. um, Blades is very similar, uh, and it 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 plays out kind of the same way. Um, I I cribbed from Vincent and Meg. I think I, there's a page in Blades that tells you how to do it, and it's essentially their method where you kind of like stop the game and go, okay, we're doing this now. Like how how do you want to go about this? 
Um, right, right. And one of the Again, key... Like putting the, like putting the power in the player's hands. Exactly, yeah. And one of the key things, and this came up in our... I think it was during the Razor's period of Blades playtesting, I think, um, where we would ask the other player, like, you wanted the group to do X, and Dylan was kind of like, eh, I don't think we should do that. And we would ask Dylan, like, hey, can, can your character be convinced... Could someone talk you into it or not? Or right, are, you, are, right. you, or are you just like, can't be convinced? And be like, right. mm, um, I could probably be convinced. Like, okay, well, Ryan, now, you, now you're now you allowed to make a roll <laughs> to right. try to convince him. Um, <laughs> right. And if Dylan's like, no, I can't be convinced, then we're like, well, looks like it's talking's not an option. What are you going to do now? You know? <laughs> and we would go through that. Is there a, uh, another way to be convinced? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but it's almost like, switching gears from that moment to moment fictional positioning discussion and who's what are you doing what are you saying to like okay stop the game we're all like in the writer's room now like all right what how do we want to deal with this right right um, and that that keeps it from being like oh i'm going to use the game mechanic to like have my way with another real human being sitting at the table like no, 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 we're not doing that. <laughs> right, we're right. Gonna ha we're going to work it out person to person and then decide what game systems are going to, like, resolve it. Right. I mean, I guess you could just decide that you're going to do the thing to someone else and and see what happens. But, you're. I mean, Blades is written specifically in that way of, like, hey, you guys should, like, talk it out before you kill each other. Right, because there is kind of a dead end to it, too. If you If you did press the issue and succeeded, they can be like, I resist it. <laughs> you know, and they're like, oh, right, yeah, well, I can't actually <laughs> win. <laughs> oh. I resist it, and I'm not playing anymore. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> that the ultimate resistance role, you just leave. <laughs> um, I resist coming here anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Agon definitely has that space for that. Um, it's, it is less, like, direct confrontational, but there is this kind of... Um, there's a reason to um, compete. So, you know, if, sure. if, if someone is like, well, I'm going to do X to convince the queen to change the rules of her court, and someone's like, well, good luck with that, because I'm going to be even more awesome and make, <laughs> make it work out this way. Uh, so it's like you're kind of racing next to each other as opposed to, like, smashing into each other. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so does anybody have any questions in chat if you want to ask anything? I mean, I could talk to John about our old games all day long. <laughs> <laughs> it is fun. We have a lot of, a lot of old stories. <laughs> if, anybody, uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions, you know, uh, uh, type it in and, and ask away. I remember one of our games that the kind of the biggest player versus player games in a game where actually I did become a god. Um, <laughs> When, uh, <laughs> when, remember I wouldn't turn, I would not turn like the, the attack vehicle around and you kept like in brain, like destroying me over and over again until I would, until I just, I died. You killed me. Yeah. And that was a apocalypse world where it was just like, I don't know. I guess I just touch you and I just keep, um, just keep destroying your brain until your brain melts all the way. <laughs> and, I, and that's what happened. I just, you kept doing, you kept succeeding. <laughs> I wouldn't stop. Yeah. I and had that. There's that brainer ability. It, it does one harm, um, right. like psychic AP. psychic damage, AP. Yeah, uh, and it was I I was I was rolling to go aggro on you because I think that's how it works. You you roll to go aggro using your brain, uh, and then you can right. threaten one harm AP with your mind. Right. Um, and I kept getting that result where it was like they can cave and do what you want or force your hand, and you're like I force your hand, and I'm like okay. I have to follow through on my threat because that's the rules of going <laughs> aggro. So you take one harm AP and you're like, cool. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. then I just... You melted, you melted my brain. I came back to life. My forearm freak, uh, not to be fucked with guy. And, and eventually I ate some kind of magic demon egg and became a god. So did Tony. That, that was a very strange... That wasn't even strictly Apocalypse World. It was... Remember we, it was Empire of Dust originally, that game? Oh, right. And right. then we like morphed it into an Apocalypse World game. Yeah. Um, 
that was really empire strange. of dust was interesting that 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 like grid battle system they had was kind of fun um we played a few of those matches where yeah. we're like shooting explosive <laughs> barrels and stuff it took a long time though it did it was slow yeah yeah um, um so we have a couple where is razors in the queue oh yeah uh hello matthew um it is it's a little complicated um null vector is like ahead of it uh because it's a stretch goal that has to be delivered um and which is a cool game too yeah uh well <laughs> null vector i don't know if you remember i don't know if you're in that game even but um those two settings like started to merge together kind of like yeah like razors was kind of the past of null vector maybe in a yeah. way um and it was like alien artifacts coming through like rifts and stuff and people we, we were trying to collect those artifacts and null vector was that was razors and null vector was more like the cyberpunk right and so, like that that computer stuff was like built off of that like alien at, at that tech. that weird technology yeah that's right yeah, yeah that's how we were playing it and that's still kind of true but um they're going to be kind of closer in time and i think i'm taking a different tack now well null vectors on version like 10 i think now but um they're going to be two different approaches like the razors team where you're kind of these mercenaries for hire um or null vector where you're more like uh a revolutionaries insurgency mm. um you're you're the, the, the one of the core ideas of null vector is that it's a one shot uh, this is the current version anyway um and it's going to use some of the some of the technology probably from uh sean's broken spire um so you can set up this thing and your your crew is like poised to strike a significant blow against the powers that be in the cyberpunk sense yeah. but um it's called null vector from the mathematics term because like the cyberpunks have lost your the the corporate dystopia has won um but you're in a position to like cripple one of them or change something for the better for your community or something or other but you don't right. play a whole campaign struggling against the systems the way you do in normal blades um you just you have your one last shot that you're taking to like do the thing um that's the current idea anyway and then in, in the same setting the razors model is more like still in the blades thing like you're you're working working stiff level kind of people trying to make your way and and get rich or famous or whatever in this world of um well the world's changed a little bit too but um it, it still has that that kind of um paramilitary action idea uh right. with some strange stuff built into it yeah john but where is it in the queue <laughs> so <laughs> no vector is first in the, in the queue and it will be uh oriented towards that one shot thing and then i'm trying right now i was working on it yesterday actually uh to see if to to build to kind of like think ahead and build stuff in no vector that i can just sort of make into racers <laughs> um, right, right, right. Right. so once once no vector is is ready I hopefully will have a pretty good head start on getting razors put back together because razors and null vector were in a very much more completed form before the blades Kickstarter, and they were part of the great culling because they they had a bunch of stuff in them that doesn't exist in blades anymore. <laughs> so, uh, like sixteen actions and uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, right. So they even though they were the most developed they also were the most like destroyed by the change of what blades turned into right um, right and i'm i'm trying to move the needle too like i don't want to just make the cyberpunk thing that everyone knows should exist for blades in the dark because it's obviously a good cyberpunk engine um yeah. there are good cyberpunk engines already out there hack the planet is is out already forge in the dark uh there's one on itch called uh, neon black which is super cool um and there's and ascendancy uh there's people already doing like very cool classic cyberpunk stuff um so i don't want to just be like yeah i'm doing one too 
I, I, I right. want to do something weird setting wise and I want it to be mechanically different and strange not like normal blades um, right so I'm kind of putting in some different tweaks uh, it actually cool. might be very different but anyway yeah long long well, way you. of answering that uh, <laughs> but uh, I know Matthew you have you have been excited about razors for a long time so uh, yeah how do you feel about lasers and feelings being among the most hacked games in existence <laughs> uh, is that great. a verifiable fact I don't know I don't know either but uh, I know it has hundreds of hacks so that's super cool um, oh hey the designer of neon cool. black is in the chat hey your game is super cool um my my i like lasers and feelings for one reason which is because <laughs> it's it's probably the greatest um thing that i've added to the the universe of role-playing games <laughs> it was like one of my favorite things because we were we were working and you're you know you sit like 20 feet from me and you're like hey i'm working on this game that i'm trying to make in like a day for it was for um the woman, the woman's group, um, the double clicks, the, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're like, oh, I, I need to like make these lists so people can roll on them. So like, you know, help me, help me finish these lists out. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I was thinking, and I typed a couple things in and then I got to my last one. I was like, oh, this is it. This is it. I made it. And I like sent it over to you and I like, ran over to your desk. I was like, oh, my email. And you're like, all right. I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The oblivion thing this, the orb. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, but that was the last one. You're like, fix everything. I was like, yes, what a good option. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a list. It's a random table of what the bad guy's plan is going to do if it comes to fruition. And Ryan included the best entry in that table, which is fix everything. It will fix everything. Uh, and people love it. And it was like the perfect, tonally perfect thing to... Um, I just just capture what that game is supposed to be and, and I was watching. players say it. it's one of the things people talk about the most when they talk to me about the game they're like oh my god that fix it's everything <laughs> like i didn't even write that <laughs> well it's funny because like i was at um it was a go place so i was watching somebody play that game and that was the that was the thing that they were trying to stop oh did they actually roll it and or they, maybe they yeah, just picked, and it. I picked yeah. it. And I'm watching, and they're like, well, we can do this thing. And like, they're like, yeah, but it's going to, if it happens, it's going to fix everything. But they're like, yeah, but we want to do, <laughs> but we're trying to stop that, right? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was, they're like, okay, I guess we're going to stop it then. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it'll fix everything. I, I don't know. That was like, that's like my highlight of, the, of, my, of my writing. It's and, a great and, one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I'm 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 super thrilled that it's been hacked a lot. Um, Rick Bud, uh, the game that he runs on Twitch, um, for it was for kind of geek and sundry, but now I think they have their own thing. Um, they've played I don't even know like dozens and dozens of hacks or and made and played them on their channel um, for years, uh, and it's just it's, it's really cool. Uh, yeah. It's... I was randomly walking around school one day, and uh, I would walk by, and somebody's like, "Oh, have you played Laser?" Not to me, but to the friend. They're like, "Have you played Laser and Feelings? What a great game!" And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> "Yeah, I, I always say like the Blaze in the Dark that took you know five, maybe six years of development work, uh, and Lasers of Feelings, which took four hours. Um, I've been played <laughs> almost the same amount, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> possibly, <laughs> maybe." <laughs> Uh, the brightest stars, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, we just finished our year-long Blades game last week. Uh, most of our quote only is that a question? Brightstone was eaten by our forgotten gods. Oh, all right. Mm. I like that. Cool. Eaten by forgotten gods. Question. Why not open up more of the open license of Dustfall to foster content growth and community? Right now, the system is open and very few people can produce content on the Shattered Isles. Um, yeah. So the... I setting IPs are virtually never open content uh, for various reasons. Um, there are a lot of good reasons for that, uh, but um, the core system stuff is because I don't need to sort of oversee it in any way as a as a creative director or whatever. Um, Meaning the forge in the dark. Yeah, if people want to use that game system and they happen to use it for some weird right wing racist content or something like that would suck and i don't want that to happen 
but also I I don't need to sort of protect it in that way because I'm 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 going to be using the Blades in the Dark setting material for my work, and right. I don't want someone to use that stuff for something weird and terrible and for it to be associated with that because then I can't use it. It's 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 going to fuck it up, right? Right, um, right, right. Not not only that, but also like if Steven Spielberg wants to make a movie set in Duskwall. He needs to pay me. That shit's not open source. Uh, so, um, uh, you hear that, Stephen? <laughs> uh, so that's that's one reason for it. But the other thing is that um, there's kind of two layers to to uh, creative works. If you want to make something that based on someone else's work, um, if there's a Creative Commons license that kind of uh, grants you permission in the dark. Uh, that's one way to go about it, and it makes it very simple. Or the open gaming license that that D and D used for um, D twenty and stuff. Um, that just means like you don't even need to contact the creator; they've just given blanket permission to whoever sees it, um, and they can use it. Like lasers and feelings hacks, no one has to ask my permission for that. Um, Forge in the dark games, make them. You don't need to pay me any money. Uh, you just do what you want with that with that core. Um, but you just can't use the dust ball setting. Well, so it, it's not that you can't use it. It's that it's copyright me. I own the right. IP. Um, right. If someone wants to use it for something to, to sell or whatever, uh, then they can ask me permission. Um, and yeah. the example I always use is Apocalypse World is not Creative Commons licensed. It's copyright Vincent and Meg Baker. Um, and there are a billion... PBTA games um, because either well at this point it's because people don't acknowledge that copyright and do whatever they want uh, but early in the process Vincent said no it's not Creative Commons it's copyright me if you want to do a PBTA game ask me my per ask for permission and I will say yes uh, and that's how all those games have come to be in the world um, right. well the initial ones I don't think people ask permission anymore but um, the, the fact that that technically is Vincent's copyrighted IP, um, you can't like copyright game mechanics really anyway, so that's not a thing. But like, right, right, um, right. If if there was an apocalypse world, a uh, lunchbox or whatever with that those graphics and trade dress and that name and the characters' names from the book and stuff, like Vincent would have a reason to contest that, and like that's that's Vincent and Meg's you know material. Right. So right. same thing with Duskwall and the Shattered Isles and all that. It's it's not for someone else to merchandise. Um, but Ryan Dunleavy right here uh, is is a good example of someone who said, "Hey, I want to make official Duskwall shit. <laughs> I want to make these awesome maps, uh, and I'm gonna sell them, <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's gonna be cool." And I was like, "Yeah, of course." You, you know blades as well as I do. Like, go for it. Do do what you want to do. Um, and there have been several examples of that. There's, there's three Blades in the Dark novels that are out already, and um, the heist deck that Andrew Shields, the novelist, also made this the heist deck, which is on Drive Through, um, which is really cool. You can like draw cards to like create a heist on the fly, and um, it has NPCs and and um, loot and all kinds of stuff. Um, and he was writing. He had a Patreon where he was writing and releasing that as well. Like every yeah. month, that was cool. And he just, he asked permission. He's like, I want to do this stuff. Um, but there's there's a hurdle since you're using someone else's work, you know. Uh, I I want I want to curate that. And so I read the novel, you know, before I was like, yeah, great, go ahead. Um, I want to have some oversight over that stuff. Uh, and, and Tim Denny uh, just came out with his set of maps, which is like the companion piece to Ryan's. Um, where Ryan's been doing like individual buildings, rooms, and and you know this like really elaborate uh, exploration of the city. Um, Tim has done kind of the other way, which is like the sh the street level guide, uh, the sort of like city map where you would be like these two streets cross here, and he named every street in the city and like did that kind of thing. Um, it's cool. It's really cool, and you know it it took a while to come out, mostly because. Tim worked pretty quickly, but then I was the bottleneck. I had to go through and read every single street name and 
every concept in it and like be like is this what i want is this right um like i not to call tim out here he's a brilliant creator but i'll just tell you part of the process uh there were references to like uh earth tarot um arcana like a, a section of streets was like staves coins swords cups or something like that um and i was like oh well there this that tarot doesn't exist in duskwall so they wouldn't call their streets that uh and he was like oh yeah cool great and he had changed them to something cool um but that i have to do that i i feel responsible for that ip so um i want to take that level of care about it right anyone's free to pitch me whatever they want to pitch and make stuff for for duskwall or for official um blades things but you know i am the bottleneck there and it's true there there could be this whole community of creators if the setting was was open source so to speak um but i have never seen that go well anywhere i basically no one does it uh it seems like it's going okay regardless it's going fine yeah there's a um, lot of really interesting people making very cool things for it anyway yeah 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 and if you want to do a fan work for anything, you know, you if you want to make your Star Wars fanfic, you can. George Lucas isn't going to, or Disney <laughs> isn't necessarily going to sue you over it. Well, who knows what they'll do, but um, yeah, yeah. if you want to make fan stuff for Blades, that's fine too. Uh, it's not like I'm saying, you know, no one make anything. Uh, but yeah, if, if you do want it to be sort of an official product, then then just ask me about it and we can work something out. There you go. Yeah. So what was the idea behind the hunting grounds mechanic and how it came to be in Blades? It says Jenkins the Great. Um, it was a kind of uh, missing piece from some of our playtests. Um, and then actually it was, I guess it was a little more important after the Kickstarter people started getting into it. But the, care, the crew creation process... Um, and the character creation process too, uh, asks you to make these decisions that kind of like pisses off this person and makes this person more your friend and you get this asset, but not that asset. And it kind of like keeps the game from starting in this, in this static position. Um, the game is already like tilted a certain direction. You're already, you know, up here and down there or whatever. So having explicitly having to say like, we have been given permission to operate as criminals in this area by this other faction um yeah it gives you some little bonuses you get a extra downtime action and stuff like that but it's more about like having to say that at the table so everyone goes oh okay so the crows are like in charge of this area and they've given us this little piece and right right there you have that that thing where someone goes well what makes them think they're so high and mighty you know da, 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 <laughs> or whatever uh and it's 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 really an excuse to create some context, drive play, and some people just ignore it uh, and are like, whatever. We're we have hunting grounds, cool, and you never really think of it again. But other groups like the Bloodletters, uh, the group with Adam and Strash and, and Sean, um, from day one, they were like, nah, nah, fuck these red sashes. We're not paying them shit. This is our turf. Like, they just were immediately like, nope, no, 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 no. Our hunting grounds are where I, we say they are. Fuck them. Um, I that, think I remember the whole vaguely, series. vaguely we talked about, like, there's a book series where, like, um, magic depends on, like, where you've, like, graffitied in the city, right? You and, told me about that. Uh, yeah. You were reading it when we were playing Blades, I think. Um, yeah, and it was like, oh yeah, like yeah, you can like draw power in certain areas of the city. You're like more powerful, and I think that's that's a little bit of where they came from. Was like, oh, all right, you know, like if you can say that you're like this is your part of the city, you have bonuses in that part of the city, which was I cannot remember what the name of that book series was, but um, yeah, wherever they had like graffiti in different parts of the city, they would like they would their magic would be a little bit stronger there and they could like it like spidered out all over the place and you could like graffiti over other people's stuff to get more of your magic there and stuff so it's like, like ley lines kind of they were like yeah yeah exactly exactly it's like mm -hmm. we have the power lines you can draw off of and, and and other people can't so that's to me that's like where that idea always came from the whole entire crew faction sheet and moving out like that was like something and you were like oh that would be cool like a whole game like that would be interesting where you have turf and i think that's where like yeah 
part of that turf idea really kind of like globbed onto it in that. It, it, yeah, and it was it was two two aspects too. It was like driving the fiction of being a small time crew in a bigger city that's not making room for you that you have to fight over as like a way to propel the type of fiction that Blades wants to be, and then also like back to that making crew sheets like what's what's fun to record that makes you feel like right you're advancing or th something's changing and just right. sort of well, saying the, like oh we have more turf that? now that's yeah. cool but it's kind of satisfying to like have that block on your sheet and be like yeah we have this right right um, and to have earned it and stuff right and it's like it, it's that, that idea again purpose like what what does our crew even do who are we and that's like it gives you that like driving where we want to go with it you yeah see that like map mm-hmm you backing up, John? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, do you ever reach a point in design, playtesting Blades, other games where you hit a problem that you couldn't solve right away? How do you approach more difficult design problems? Uh, yeah, all the time. Um, <laughs> to, well, f first of all, um, play playing the game regularly is, is key for my process. Um, week to week, if possible, and um, if you can't like resolve it in the moment at the table, that's fine. Think about it during the week, come back with a iteration, try something different. If you're playing super regularly and iterating super regularly, it feels less problematic. Uh, if you're, if you are spending like six months working on something for one play test night and you're like, ah, ah, fuck. And then you get that one thing and it doesn't work. And then you have another six months of like trying to wrestle it. It can feel like, I, I I don't know what to do. So playing regularly and sh and iterating rapidly helps each aspect feel less like big and overwhelming because you're doing it so much. Um, but also, I will I either just replace that system with someone decides, um, or if you want, you can flip a coin as a placeholder and you'll either discover like, wow, that's very unsatisfying to have someone just decide or flip a coin. I need to write a cool mechanic for that because it really matters. But sometimes it doesn't matter. And it's, you're like, oh, that I don't need a mechanic for that. This game, it doesn't require us to mechanize that thing. Um, Cause it was working fine when someone just decided. So, okay. Uh, so don't, don't be afraid to to just pull something out and ignore it if it's really causing you grief. Um, and and the other thing that helps me uh, is playing as many different games as I can all the time. Um, the last year or so, I've been trying to play a lot of board games. and uh, But whatever you're playing, video games, board games, RPGs, whatever. Um, that that like perpendicular thinking you know can really help where you're stuck on something and then you play formula d and see how the gear shifting mechanic works and you go oh yeah per oh i just now i get how to do whatever in my in my game um it's good to have that like toolbox of stuff um to help you when you're stuck so those three things i would say play and iterate rapidly uh, don't be afraid to um, ignore a troublesome mechanic and see if you actually need it, and then play lots of games and program your brain. Don't be afraid to kill your babies is what I was told. <laughs> I think darlings is usually the phrase, but uh, oh, you, yeah, you can so kill whatever. your babies if you want. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay, I'm not from Philly. <laughs> Philly style. Philly style. We do things different there, okay? Um, well, that's interesting about the playing other games. A couple of questions in here um, about the uh, like Forge in the Dark hacks. Uh, what are the Forge in the Dark hacks you've seen that are most out there? The biggest departure from Core Blades. Have you played any? Some some questions around that. Um, yeah, there's there's a fair. I mean, it's not a hugely wide range at this point, but I know some stuff that's in development that's pretty different um girl by moonlight uh which is coming out pr pr probably this year the quarantine has affected 
production stuff a lot, but um, Andrew Gillis's game about magical girls, uh, it's really cool, and it, it does some interesting things to the core formulas of Blades, um, stripping some stuff out completely, uh, actually inverting some things from how they normally work. Um, it's a little more stripped down. So, yeah, it's cool in that in that regard. Um, Dylan's uh, current version of Blades Against Darkness has a mechanism that we sort of workshopped together, which I'm probably going to use for something that, that changes the way the dice work. Um, you basically only roll for risky actions and controlled and desperate actions don't use dice. Um, mm. which is kind of, kind of a cool way to think about it. Um, but I think every, uh, every, all of the hacks have some kind of departure, um, that makes them interesting. Um, a nocturne is, is one that, uh, is really strange psychedelic space kind of not psychedelic that's the wrong word kind of like dark weird sci-fi um uh oh, what's another one that i just saw that's kind of strange um i'm blanking on the name it's so hard to keep track of them now uh there's there's so many well even like trophy uh this game i don't know if you've heard of trophy but um I just had a big Kickstarter, and it's it's really cool. It's a very simple game, um, but it has some Blades DNA in it um, from C Cthulhu Dark uh, and and Blades, and probably something else I'm forgetting as its as its parents. But um, it it takes that kind of Blades in the Dark uh, position and and effect uh, thing, and does it in this really stripped down, simplistic way, which is co very cool. Um, I don't. I. I don't think they call it forged in the dark. I think it's kind of its own thing. Um, but it's there's a chain there, you know. Um, and I think we're gonna see, probably like Andrew and I have been talking about how, like, there was Apocalypse World, and then Avery made Monster Hearts, and it's like, obviously, a Powered by the Apocalypse game, but it it takes all of those tools and puts them in this very different place, and people really kind of people who didn't understand apocalypse world really got it when they saw monster hearts um i think girl by moonlight will be the monster hearts for blades it'll be the uh different enough thing that will bring in a different audience and um also maybe be less intimidating as a dark g gritty f faction filled world of you know nightmares and stuff it'll, it'll be a little more like <laughs> empowering and fun and and easy to learn <laughs> so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that a lot but there's so, there are seriously so many um and there's a bunch on itch.io if you want to find like the newest uh forge in the dark games you can go search over there i think one of the next games i want to play is uh, band of blades that seemed like a really cool Band of Blades is great. Yeah, it's got like Change of the, system. the structure of that game is so cool. Um, yeah, yeah, that sounded really neat. I read through that a couple of times, and I'm like, yeah, I think I'm gonna run this game. Yeah, you're playing like the nameless rookies and an important soldier and the quartermaster of the legion, and like doing all this. Like, oh man, it was like really one of my favorite thought. things about it is that the playbook things, the like the general and the or the commander and the quartermaster and all those one of those is the gm right and so it just makes it so you're like oh i'll be quartermaster this time you be gm and you be the lore master and, and you can just like swap them around um it's really cool yeah that's it probably the next thing i'm going to jump into yeah um, I, I think you would really like it this is an interesting question what comes to mind when you think of duskwall in 60 in-game years time mm. Um, well, no spoilers, but uh, <laughs> Flame Without Shadow, which is the Blue Coats Inspectors and Spirit Wardens supplement. Um, the uh, initial version is up on the Blades website for free now, if you can go get it in the supplements page. Um, it is moving the timeline forward. I think it's only 10 years right now. Uh, there's another product that may exist in the future that is a little further ahead. But the, the initial things are kind of what you would expect um, culturally and technologically uh, from the kind of 
early industrial age moving forward. So photography and, and telegraph and radio and stuff. But of course, you know, in blades. Quicksilver film stock means you're seeing stuff that may, maybe isn't really there when you take pictures. Um, radio propagates through the ghost field, of course, so that's a whole thing that will that will change how that plays out. Um, and uh, some other, like technological stuff is definitely going to be part of it up through World War One-ish kind of tech, I would say. Um, Self-repeating firearms and things like that. Um, and then culturally too, uh, the, the main problem in um, Flame Without Shadow is, is the Coleridge troubles where the unionization efforts, which are hinted at in the Core Blades book have totally exploded and workers' rights are like coming to the forefront. And, um, you know, in our world, those people fought and died for, for a weekend and for eight hour a day work days and all that kind of stuff. And Duskwall has nothing like that. They have no labor laws at all. Uh, do whatever you want. Um, so that, that thing is happening and the powers that be are trying to squash it in, in various ways. Um, was that a Blaze game that we had where we had street urchins as like, I think that was one of our, we had street urchins that were like our little minions and they were always getting killed. <laughs> Yeah, they were not. We were te we were terrible people. They were not happy. Uh, no, no. We uh, had a network of street urchins that were just always. Oh man, Chris McDowell, was... who wrote Into the Odd, which we played way back in the day, um, he just put out Electric Bastion Land, which is his expanded version of Into the Odd, also going into the future of electricity and then people have bicycles and things. Um, oh, I, that's right. I heard your interview with him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That game is so cool. Um, but one of the you roll your character randomly and one of the characters you can roll is a gang of street urchins and every one of your hit points is one of the urchins <laughs> <laughs> oh we played that game we did yeah <laughs> we did <laughs> they were not they did not like that um did i answer that see. question I, I think uh, so. oh 60 years in the future yeah uh yeah it, the timeline uh, there's some things that probably won't match Earth history, obviously, because it's different. Um, but uh, yeah, there's 60 years. I can't. I I, I I don't know. I can't say for sure. Um, but there is definitely an arc towards sort of technological and societal progress um, that will be derailed um, because the world is totally broken and can't sustain itself anymore so we need an uncataclysm um, yeah exactly <laughs> exactly control z yeah <laughs> do over um there are some discrepancies between ryan's amazing maps and those from old dog games canals waterways are a bit different etc what are your thoughts on differences at this point areas that aren't fully realized yet like done slow I mean, I, mean, I have thoughts, but you probably do too on that one, right? <laughs> what, <do you> th <laughs> what do you think about discrepancies between maps? Oh uh, man, you know, doesn't doesn't bother me. <laughs> I, 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 any any opinions you have about it? Uh, you know what? It's it's kind of funny. It's like working on that. I mean, I made that big map so long ago. Um, that I look I look at that and I'm like, well, it could be like way more detailed, and there's a lot of different things that could be done on it, and can change and I've changed it too. Like I've added canals and waterways and stuff already. And it changes even when I like do the zoomed in views of buildings. And I don't know the old dog game. I don't even know what are the old dog games. The, the, those are Tim Denny's, the street maps. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, he goes like way more. Um, he got like way, way more in depth than I did. Mine is kind of like the old cartographer's sketch, you know, of, of, you know, and we actually joke like because I, I left and, and and traveled for a year, but I still kind of worked on it. But like there were unfinished areas and it was like, oh, you know, the cartographer died before he finished, you know, parts of the map. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so like that's why some of that stuff isn't there and isn't completed. But now I'm kind of like going back and redoing that. Um, and then looking at his, it's like, wow, there's like he has a lot more detail in there than I've ever put in, um, which in a way is like kind of intimidating. And in some ways, I mean, it's like it's awesome. 
it's like this really awesome detailed map. Well, it depends on how you look at it, because like you put in like what's inside someone's house, so <laughs> that's a that's a level of detail that's <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, it's a, well, it's also I mean they look very different and it's a stylized difference and stuff like that, but um, you know like per canon and stuff, and I, somebody actually said this to me like. Um, that the name of the market was wrong in one place and like, Oh, we're like using these as like canon in our games. And I'm like, Oh, like, I don't know. I, I, I to me, it's like, I don't want to say like, well, I don't care. Um, but it's, it's hard for me. I would just say to th the person asking, uh, and I, 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 maybe they're not being super serious with their question, but like, um, you know, have you ever like used a map, uh, in the real world? Like it's, it might happen that you go down a street where the refinery is supposed to be and it's not there. Right. Uh, Cause when they made the map, it was, or the city planner said they were going to put it there. So they put it on the map and then they never built it or whatever. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I did wind up, I, I wind up changing that name. To, it was the, it was the night market was where I had drawn it, but it was like the silver market or something in the book. And he's like, Oh, well that's the silver market. I was like, Oh, well that makes sense. So I changed it. It's like, all right. I mean, they're both markets and they're both the same. So it was like, oh, it's a silver market on the one map. Yeah. So that for me, you know, that 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 makes sense. I, th I feel like the world is it like kind of like you were saying, it just changes so much. It's like it would be it'd be like impossible to keep up with that. To yeah. Like oh, make all these changes that reflect all these things. Yeah. You go down to Wall Street and like, where's the wall? There's supposed to be a wall here. Uh, like, well, there was, I mean, you know, it's, that's, that's, I, I, that's something I have always really liked. I like having a map cause it lets the players be like, Ooh, look, there's a, like, especially yours are like, there's a skylight on this building. Let's climb up there. Um, <laughs> or like, or on Tim's, you can be like, okay, well, if we're going to hold this turf, it, it's, it's four clean streets. So we just need four choke points or, oh my God, it's this maze of alleyways. What, what, what are we going to do? Right. Um, right. But it's really nice to have conflicting messages because then the it, it it lets the players be creative. They're not like, well, in year four twenty four, this happened and we have to do the thing. Instead, they can just be like, hmm, this says it's a market and this one says that it's a park. Like, okay, <laughs> it used to be a park and they raised it and now it's a market, or they have a market in the park, or you know, like you have to start like make up something. They could start with my map, and then they can upgrade to Tim's map later when they get more intel. <laughs> That's, true. Resource. That's true. Your map is like <laughs> someone's experience of being there and drawing it. And Tim's <laughs> is like, here's the official government-issued street map of the city. <laughs> that is exactly it. Somebody who like walked the streets and was like, yeah, I guess this is where all these buildings are. And I don't know. Sure. Like, yeah. The other guy's like, yeah, no, we need to really like measure this place out. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, one of the reasons that I, when I release maps, I do ones with like furniture in there, but then I do the plan one, which is like blank. And there's one with the text that says like, this is the name of this place. And there's one without that, because like, I'm not going to tell you in your game, like what you should use this for. You should yeah. be able to use it for whatever you want and call it whatever you want. That's fine. Like write the name in there and that's great. Like I'm not trying to dictate to anybody like that. That's what that building is. It's not, those are your games and you should build that world too. And like you said, like it could have changed, like it could have been a bar once and now it's a house and now, you know, and then it's a bank. Like and that's how the world works, you know? Buildings change. Yeah. And they don't even not gonna knock them down and make new ones. I think that's a thing I didn't put in the city generation tables in the back. I, I think Chris put it in Electric Bastion Land, and I was like, God damn it. One of the things is like, what did this used to be? Because um, that's, oh, su yeah. that's such a nice detail if it's, you know, there's there's the bar in Seattle here that used to be a butcher's shop uh, or whatever. And that just ad it adds a nice layer, a nice layer to it. So, yeah. Um, but I don't know, maybe do you, maybe you mind when I put like this, the, the a couple maps ago, the Speria one that mm -hmm. was like the, the glass thing and i was like i don't know there's like weird stuff floating there nobody knows what it is <laughs> like i'm kind of adding to the lore and i don't know if that bothers you or not but i to me one of the best things about making the maps is like thinking of the stories that like why they were there like how it does fit into the world or really how it doesn't like that's an oddity for a lot of people like i don't know why that exists and we don't know who made it so like and people go there to see it and i i think that's kind of fun to just make those things up in my mind. I think one of the things that I I really liked was the, uh, in the center, there's like the old wall, right? That like, yeah. I've used several times in games where it's like, oh, it's solidified plasma. And like, 
you can go and you can like you can mine that oh wow that's interesting uh, yeah 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 and i'm like you can go mine that and it's got weird properties and like spirits could be in there and stuff like because it was like the the one day the the power net just like flash froze and it's like you can go there and you see like ghosts in the field like frozen oh, shit. So, like, people are always like oh yeah i want to take a couple shards of that i'm like oh great <laughs> nothing bad is gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> this is not fine for you. Yeah, just keep mining it. You're good. You're fine. <laughs> First of all, your skin falls off. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then someone stabs you in the heart. And you're dead. <laughs> Role playing. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> um, let's see. How far away are the airships? So I don't know. Airships. Are there, airships? there are airships in Imperial City. Uh, oh, cur current day in Blades in the Dark. Um, but uh, they are, they will be in Flame Without Shadow. They're, they're coming over to Duskwall. Uh, well, they're not coming over. They, that, no one is, has yet had the nerve to do that. Um, they're building some in the city. Uh, so, yeah, there will, be, there will be some airships. Who doesn't want airships? I mean, come on. Yeah, they make everything cooler. Why not? Yeah. Everybody get on board this totally safe and reliable technology. <laughs> We got to get to. Uh, I'm not gonna say it. Never mind. <laughs> Secrets. <laughs> you got to keep some. Um, Apple Maps versus Google Maps. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, we've been rolling for like two hours here, John. Any any final thoughts? Um, final thoughts. I mean, yeah, it's it's been great to talk. Uh, we used to do this almost every day, so uh, yeah. it's. I've missed that a lot, and um, yeah, I think it's cool to to go back to the beginning and um, just really see uh, the, your your perspective on it and uh, how the game came together, and um, continuing on to now, like the freaking solid plasma wall, you know, <laughs> like just <laughs> <laughs> having having that 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 full long arc from before it existed at all to right right now making stuff yeah. for it is it's yeah. that's that's really cool i love it I, it makes me really happy to get that email and see the next thing that you posted and and just be like fuck <laughs> well thanks for making a game and, and building a world that everyone can enjoy it's good stuff and i, I mean yeah, i hope uh, people keep making new stuff for it and everything and new maps and uh you know Hopefully, I hope to have a couple more of these. Um, might be calling it the Insight Roll. I think that's a pretty good name for this. Um, yeah, let me. Uh, I'm gonna one. put um, Ryan's Patreon in the chat, uh, so everyone can see what we're talking about. This is this video is is provided by that Patreon. Uh, it's Ryan Dunleavy, right? Yep. And thanks for all the questions, everybody. That's awesome, and and visiting, and wow, I broke that link somehow. But go go there. Um, you got two periods in there. That's two two dot com. Son of a bitch. Can't undo can't undo in chat, John. I know. This is the real world. I tried. I make a resistance roll. <laughs> um. Yeah. Go check out Ryan. He makes awesome maps and. Uh, I'm looking forward to future talks here. I think you said I don't I don't know if you want to tease it, but maybe more uh, old old timers. I hope um, so. I hope so. That's that's the plan. To reach out to some people and see if they want to come on and uh, what their memory is of of these games and how it came about. And that'd be that'd be cool to have more people on. I'm really looking forward to those conversations personally. Like not being there and to just to just listen to like the 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 memory version of it. Like what. <laughs> everyone's going to have a slightly different um, memory of what it was. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that'll be cool. Yeah. All, All right. right. Well, uh, thanks for watching, everybody. John. I will. And I will um, thank you, everyone, for watching. And uh, hopefully I'll figure out a different way to stream it because it's not always going to be on John's Twitch. <laughs> we'll get that sorted <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody. See ya. Have a good night. Bye.